one of the greatest episodes in not just Star Trek The Next Generation, but the entirety of Star Trek canon is Measure of a Man, in which Data the android's status as a human, a sentient being, is quite literally put on trial. More than any other, that episode also influenced the Star Trek Picard series. Measure of a Man was written by Melinda Snodgrass, an accomplished novelist known for the Circuit trilogy, and for both writing for, as well as co-editing, George R. R. Martin's long-running Wild Cards Shared World series. As a screenwriter, she has also written for, among others, The Profiler, The Outer Limits, and Odyssey 5, to name but a few. Today, she is joining Pom and myself to talk about her work, her Next Generation episode, Measure of a Man, and its influence on Star Trek Picard. It is my pleasure to welcome Melinda Snodgrass. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for inviting me. Uh, I, I'm so looking forward to this. I've, I've heard just wonderful things about your work and your presence and your, your input on, uh, on all things genre, especially Star Trek. Thank you. We are honored to, to hear that from, from someone as important to Star Trek as you. Well, thank you. Now I'm blushing. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yes, let us uh, move on, because we know that you have a background and professional experience in law. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then how did you become, decide to become a writer? Uh, my life has been a series of unexpected occurrences, is <laughs> basically what happened. Um, my father, it was very important to him that I become an attorney. And so to I loved him very much. We were very, very close. So I went ahead and I went to law school. And I knew at the end of the first semester that I had made a terrible mistake. Um, I love the law um, but and the study of the law, but I couldn't it was just a community in which I didn't feel comfortable. I was also a singer. Um, in my misbegotten youth, I, I studied opera in Vienna um, and I had hoped to be a great opera star, but I'm not exactly built for it. I'm, you know, five foot two and, you know, weigh a hundred pounds. So that wasn't going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so I went to law school and unfortunately I was very good at it. So I sort of breezed through law school and, then I passed the bar on the first try. And uh, at that point, you sort of feel like, well, I guess I better go practice law. So I did, uh, I worked first for the government um, and for the Sandia Laboratories. And that was sort of killer. And then I went and I wanted to, you know, practice, but I ended up in a corporate law firm because it's sort of where you're going to find yourself, you know, and unfortunately, my specialty or fortunately, my specialty was constitutional law in law school. And you can't make a living at that. I mean, you can't hang out a shingle and say, bring me your big constitutional cases. So I ended up in this corporate law firm. And it was just a miserable experience. It's really bad when you go into your office in the morning and you close your door and you cry for 15 minutes and then you compose yourself and go to work. So at the time, my, my dearest friend in the world was a writer named Victor Milan. And uh, Victor and I became good friends. We met in a bookstore, of course. And um, one day Vic invited me to come to a group autographing at a mall and Roger Zelazny was there and and Fred Saberhagen and Susie McKee Charnas and Vic and and his friend and you know I went and it was fun and then afterwards the Saberhagens invited me to a barbecue at their house and uh it was the most fascinating evening. I walked from room to room and Susie was discussing the effect of linguistics on culture. And Fred was reading this insane letter from this man in Romania who was complimenting him on his book, The Holmes Dracula File. But as you read this crazy eight page letter, it became more and more clear this guy thought he was Dracula. So that was hilarious. And I thought these are the most interesting people I have ever met in my life. I want to be with them because lawyers are really kind of boring. It seemed like every time I got together with lawyers, they talked about billable hours. You know, we weren't discussing sort of <laughs> grand issues of constitutional law. So I turned to Vic and clutched him and said, I have to be part of this. And he said to me, because I was a singer and I was singing a lot. And Vic said to me, 
you know, you're very creative and I bet you could write if you tried and I'll help you. So I started writing novels in secret and uh, then Vic and I would meet up at midnight at the Vips Big Boy and he would go over my chapters. I don't know why it had to be midnight, but that seemed to be when we did it. And, um, and then I sold the book. And also, I, you know, I'm, as people laugh at me, but Star Wars helped me get up the courage to just quit, quit that dang job. And so I did um, and started writing books. And then how I got into Hollywood is another one of those, I bet you could write if you tried kind of conversations. But How did Star Wars help you? Okay, um, I've loved science fiction since my dad read me 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea to help me go to sleep at night. And, and A Princess of Mars was the very first book I ever read by myself when I was seven years old. And Star Wars was just, I mean, it just took my breath away. That, that opening when the, the, the little freighter goes over and then here comes the Imperial Star Destroyer and oh my God. And it was actually Empire Strikes Back. Vic and I had a habit of seeing Star Wars on opening day. That was just sort of something we always did. And I'm sitting there in Empire. And when Yoda said to Luke, do or do not, there is no try. It was like somebody had hit me between the eyes because I had been sitting there dithering. Oh God, I hate this job. I'm so unhappy. I really want to. And suddenly I thought, you know, he's right. There is no try. There's either do it or don't. And I walked in the next day and I typed up my letter of resignation. I packed up my plant and my d diplomas, laid the letter on my boss's desk and I walked out. I didn't even give him two weeks notice. Wow. Um, and <laughs> so I have this deep love of Star Wars because in some ways it, it helped me find the courage to find my life. Now, know? did you have a love of uh, sci-fi before Star Wars? Like, did you grow up watching like Star Trek and stuff like that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Obviously, it's a mean, precursor. <laughs> yeah, it's a precursor. I mean, Star Trek was, again, I'm a kid and suddenly my dream, it's a spaceship. Oh, my God. Um, I, I just, I was overwhelmed by it. And I drove my parents crazy because if they wanted to, you know, we should all go out to dinner tonight. I was like, no, you know, I have to see Star Trek. Um, and that was, you know, before you had VCRs and ways to record things. Right. And um, no, I fell madly in love with, with Spock and Kirk and McCoy and loved the show. And then when I was, you know, all of them, UFO, that, that fabulous Brit series that, uh, that I just, I really adored. I would race home from a job to eat a very late lunch so I could catch UFO on a Saturday afternoon. I mean, because there was so little available. And now, of course, we're in the right. golden age of science fiction and fantasy television and movies and games and everything else. But, you know, back in the day, it was it was pretty sparse out there. So I'm writing novels and living my life. And um in a role playing group, because Vic introduced me to role playing. In fact, I'm writing a blog post about that now for our Wild Cards website. And George R.R. R. Martin moves down to New Mexico. Uh, and he was, you know, didn't know anybody and got introduced around. And we all became very close friends. And George and I became very, very close friends. He's my best friend in the world. And um, life goes on and we're gaming and we're writing books and we create wild cards. And then George got the opportunity to go to Hollywood to work first on the new Twilight Zone and then on Beauty and the Beast. And uh, one day he called me from Hollywood, from Los Angeles and, and he said, um, hey Snod, <laughs> that's his nickname for me. <laughs> um, hey Snod, I think you'd be pretty good at this screenwriting thing. And if you want to write a spec script, I'll show it to my agent. And I went, okay. And this is when George gave me the best piece of writing advice I've ever gotten. Um, so then George gives me the little lecture. At the time, this was how you broke into Hollywood. You wrote a spec script, you, you know, got it read by some people. If they liked your work, you'd come in and pitch. But George said to me, you never, ever, ever will sell your spec script. It's just a calling card. All it does is get you in the door. So, you know, just be aware you're never going to sell this thing. As I was trying to think of what I would write, and I started watching Next Generation, and I noticed that the data character, there was a wonderful tie-in to an infamous Supreme Court decision, the Dred Scott decision, 
where the question was whether a slave was a person or property. And the court ruled he was property. And I thought, well, data's a toaster. So, you know, how is he any different than the computer on the ship? And that gave me the idea for the measure of a man. But Georgia told me I would never sell my spec. So I called him back and I said, hey, George, you know, I, I don't want to waste this really good idea. So what if I save it? I write something else and I save that for my pitch if I get a pitch. And George said to me, never hoard your silver bullet, meaning lead with the very best thing you can do and the thing you're most passionate about. So I wrote The Measure of a Man. George gave it to his agent. And then we promptly had a six month strike <laughs> and I forgot about it, went back to writing my books. And then I got the call that Star Trek wanted to talk to me. And so I flew out for a meeting um, and with my three by five cards clutched in my sweaty little hands, ready to pitch my other ideas. And as I started after initially meeting Morris Hurley, I started, well, sir, I have these other ideas. And he put his finger up to his lips and he went, shh. And then he pointed at this big whiteboard over his head and it had the shooting schedule for the upcoming episodes and there was the measure of a man. And uh, they bought my script. <laughs> so, um, and then I was in a notes meeting about two weeks later and at the end of, they had me come back to LA for a notes meeting. And at the end of that meeting, Maury said to me, um, I'm hiring you and you start on Monday. And this was a Thursday, so I had to go back to New Mexico, find somebody to live in my house and pack up and go to LA. So that's how I got into Hollywood. Again, it was somebody saying, you know, I bet you could write if you tried. And that's been sort of the history of my career. That was your first script for a script to TV and it's one of the best right? in the entire next generation era, not just the next generation, but the whole era. and. Uh, even though you didn't like your practice in law, it certainly prepared you for that. Now, did, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when I, I do a lot of guest lecturing at universities and even high schools, and one of the things I stress to the students is, you know, stay in school. I'm like a little PSA <laughs> announcement, but, you know, stay in school, get a degree, because nothing that you study is ever wasted, especially if you want to be a writer. I mean, we, we just were, we, we just hoard stuff and pull it to ourselves constantly. And so I'm always in favor of, you know, come on people, you know, study everything you possibly can be interested in everything. So no, and then I'm so grateful that I got the education that I did. I couldn't have done a lot of the work I've done uh, because I went on to subsequent TV shows that were lawyer shows. Yeah, LA uh, Law, one of my personal favorites. I, I only got to propose a story. I never actually got to write a script, but I worked on Reasonable Doubts, which was a lawyer cop show thing. And uh, I was the only lawyer on the staff. Um, at one point I said something in a meeting and everybody turned to me and said, now I know why Shakespeare said to kill all the lawyers. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> sorry, sorry, you know, this is how we're trained. Um, yeah. But uh, no, I, I, I regret nothing. In fact, I have a book series that, um, that we're reissuing now under my own name instead of a pseudonym about a young woman law lawyer working in a vampire law firm in Manhattan. So um, that draws on some of my experiences. That sounds so, interesting. Yeah, very interesting, yeah. Okay, they always tell you to write what you know. So evidently knowing what you did helped write arguably one of the best episodes in Star Trek history. And speaking of Star Trek, what was it like working on The Next Generation? Was Well, for me, I mean, it was, it was you know, an enormous opportunity. Uh, it launched my Hollywood career and I will never, never regret that. It was a difficult show. I mean, it, it had issues, um, which, you know, had been detailed in a number of, of documentaries and, and articles. I was a story editor and um, sort of the, you know, one wrong among staff writer. I mean, the irony about Hollywood, as George always says, is that if you have writer in your title, it means you're the lowest of the low. I mean, you, you want to lose that as quickly as possible and become, you know, get a co-producer, you know, supervising producer, executive producer. But I was a story editor. So my job was to uh, be in the room with the other writers, come up with story ideas, plots for upcoming episodes, 
uh, write scripts, also rewrite scripts uh, from freelance writers that would come in. Um, I rewrote uh, um, The Offspring, uh, for example, because I was kind of the data girl. You know, I, I loved that character. I found him, well, Brent was wonderful. And I found Data to be just the most interesting character with the most possibility for growth, which is really kind of sad when your show and the robot is the most interesting person. But um, but for me, he was. And so I ended up writing a lot and, and rewriting things that, that dealt with Data uh, for that reason. And, uh, you know, then mostly it's what is in every writer's room. You know, you all get in a room together and you start plotting out the episodes and putting them up on the whiteboard, you know, uh, breaking the story, which I had always been an outliner, even with my novels, but uh, Hollywood really taught me how to break a story, how to outline. And I brought it back to our writers group in New Mexico and we use it for novels as well as for, for scripts. And it's such a useful tool. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people say, you know, it's better to be a pantser or it's better to be an outliner. You know, I think whatever works for you, but for myself, if you're writing on deadline, I just don't think you can do better than to have a, a template that you're working from. It really does focus you each day when you go to work. Data, of course, is a fan favorite, and I think a lot of that can be attributed to you, and I think a lot of it started with the episode Measure of a Man because it seemed at that point that's where I feel like Data went from being more of a comedic relief to a much more deeper character. And you also pointed out earlier uh, in the original case that that episode is based on, uh, the case went in the opposite direction. So how did you get around that to get to the conclusion that you have in the episode? Well, there were a number of things that came together to really make this work. Um, I mean, there were sort of these weird things. Like, first of all, I had a different teaser in the spec script I wrote. My teaser had data learning how to swim. And I had learned from Mike Akuda or from reading something from the, the tech boys that data weighs like 400 pounds. You know, he's not, he's not human. And so my thought was he's read every book there is and then he goes to swim and he sinks like a stone. Um, and he's baffled by this. And Maury said to me once I was hired and we were working to get the script ready to go to the set and shoot, he said, we don't go on location almost ever. And, um, his makeup, Brent's makeup will come off. So you've got to come up with a different teaser. And so I created the poker game because of the same situation. You know, you can Which read also became synonymous with the show, yeah. Yes, and it was out of sheer necessity. Um, and then when I was writing spec, um, I had a good friend who was an aspiring writer. He was a retired naval aviator. And he was, you know, hanging around the writing community and working on a novel and very nice man. And I told him, I was so excited about the spec script I was writing, you know, for George's agent. I was like, woo. And I told him what I was doing with it. And I said, but something, I'm still missing something. And he looked at me and he said, Melinda, when we are on a ship at sea, and we, are, we don't have access to the JAG, uh, you know, the, the judge advocate general, the lawyers of the military. He said, it is customary if you have a situation that has to be resolved, the captain always defends and the first officer always prosecutes. And immediately then I was like, okay, that's it. That's the piece I need. Because then you had Picard and Riker in conflict with each other. Um, and there was frankly not enough conflict between the characters on Next Generation, at least during my time there. Um, and I felt that was actually a weakness in the show. So I was excited by that. And, uh, and my God, you know, Patrick and Jonathan were just, were just wonderful because Jonathan brought this sort of, I really respect him, but damn, I want to beat him. You know, even though I know what it means to the data, competitiveness, the yeah. competitive of the, you know, and I mean, in the fencing scene that gets got added back in for the extended version, it was supposed to be Riker and Picard fencing, but they didn't have time to choreograph the fight because uh, Patrick is very good at stage fighting. Uh, Jonathan hadn't done a lot of it. So they had some random dude come in and, you know, fence with Picard. So that was, you know, a little bit disappointing, but these things happen. I mean, it's television, so you do what you can. And then the final very weird thing that happened um, that actually ended up making the script 
better than I ever imagined it could be, was that um, Whoopi Goldberg had a contract to be in X many episodes of Next Generation that year. And at first they were like, no, Whoopi's not in this. And then they suddenly realized just a few days before we started shooting that she needed to be in this in order to meet her contractual agreement. And so Maury called me in and he said, uh, you got to write a scene for Guinan and you've got three hours. And I went, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> welcome to Hollywood. Um, so I paced around my little tiny office on the third floor about, you know, for two hours and got an idea and came down and Maury and I sat and kicked it around. I mean, that's the one thing I love about writing uh, for Hollywood for writing for television is that when a group of writers get together and they, you know, you pool your brain power and it can be so rewarding. And so we kicked around the scene, we discussed it and then, you know, got it. And as I explained what I thought it should do. And then Maury said, you, okay, go write it. Um, and that was the 10 forward scene, which I really think, I mean, my God, that scene between, you know, Patrick and Whoopi was just, it was, it was amazing. Um, and it was kind of the, the heart and soul of the, of the episode. Um, but again, um, necessity is the mother of invention. So that was what happened with that. And then, you know, then they shot it. And fortunately, um, it sailed through without any further, because there were some issues because Gene had this idea that there were no lawyers in the 20. Third or twenty, whichever century we were in, there were no lawyers, um, and that data might probably be delighted to take part in this experiment. And you know, it was like, oh well, then we don't have a script. You know, if you want. That's a to very do good that. point. Yeah, because uh, Gene famously didn't want any conflict between any of the main characters in the cast. Correct. Cool. So, so you found a very clever way, actually, of, of creating a conflict that was necess necessary in a way. And I mean, I get where, you know, he was saying, you know, but no, I, I think it makes complete sense that, you know, data doesn't want to be disassembled. And yeah. Like, you know, that, yeah. that scene, he's like, I, I don't find, I have very much confidence in your. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially because he doesn't know if Maddox is going to, you know, screw it all up. Exactly. It's like, oh, well, maybe not. Um, so yeah, it, it struck me it would be no. And, and, you know, as an attorney, I was like, there is no way in hell that there aren't lawyers in the Star Trek universe because, you know, even if you assume there is no crime, which I find to be, you know, unbelievable. You need lawyers to draft contracts, to handle treaties, conflicts of law between different legal systems, divorce, child custody. I mean, there are so many issues in which, you know, without law, you don't have civilization. Um, so that's, you know, where I come down. And so I always thought that was sort of an odd, an odd idea, but uh, we managed to get around it <laughs> and we had lawyers. No, and it works wonderfully and like i said i think it added an extra layer to data's character that i don't think anybody really saw up there before so then you were you you had then written a measure of a man uh which i'm sure was a resounding su success even internally uh, at the studio but then what were your assignments in star trek going forward um well i I took an outline that had been done by a writer from the previous season um, called Pen Pals, and um, Maury gave it to me to write. Um, he said, "He said you're a very passionate writer and you get data, so would you please take Pen Pals and take this this proposal that we have? We don't have it fully fleshed out, and write a script about that." So I did, and um, and and that was where I got to get. Picard to ride a horse. That was fun because um, I'm a horsewoman, even though I hate the holodeck, but that's an aside. And then I had this idea. I wanted Data to have to cope with that command is an ephemeral thing. You know, it's very, very hard to, you know, be a commander. Um, and so I wrote the instance of command, which also had some legal stuff in it, plus the Data figuring out sometimes you just have to be a kind of big, mean, you know, take charge kind of guy to get people to do what you want them to do. Um, that script got rewritten. Um, it's one of the few times I've ever been rewritten on any show I've ever been on, which was disappointing to me. I actually think my script was was stronger than what they ultimately shot, but that's the, that's the risk you take in Hollywood. And then I rewrote The Offspring and The High Ground. And so, you know, I, I did my job. I, I 
I rewrote, I wrote, I helped plot scripts. I, um, you know, we took pitches. We, we tried to, you know, find new young writers like Ron Moore, um, who was such a tremendous addition to our team. Um, and, you know, I learned a great deal. Uh, it was my first job. So, and I have to say that Ira Bear, uh, who went on to then do Deep Space Nine was, was really instrumental in, in helping me learn so much about the art of being a, being a screenwriter and also being a producer. And Ricky and Hans, you know, I, I felt like I had, uh, I had very good mentors while I was there. And, uh, you know, it launched my Hollywood career. Eventually, you moved on from Star Trek. How did that happen? Well, it was, um, you know, we were almost, I think we were like two weeks or something from the end of the third season, and I was pretty burnt out. Um, Star Trek was, as I said, a difficult show um, in terms of our leadership. And uh, I was the only woman above the line um, at that point. You know, it was all male leadership and me. And uh, I, I just, I was worn out. And I mean, when you, when a show goes seven years and has something like 47 writers over those seven years, you can tell that there were probably some issues because most shows are more stable than that. And I just, uh, I was, I actually was pretty much decided I wasn't going to work in Hollywood anymore. I was going to go home to New Mexico and I was going to write books and ride horses and, you know, be done with it. Um, and so I, I asked to leave early, a, bit, a couple of weeks early, and they said, okay. And I went home and then my agent got me another job and pulled me back in on reasonable doubts. It was a difficult experience. And, you know, for the time being, I'm leaving it at that. Um, uh, but I, I had support. George was there over, over working on Beauty and the Beast and, you know, was, was always there to prop me up when things got really tough. Well, of course, you, you did go on to work on several other sci-fi shows, not just uh, uh, like Reasonable Doubts and an L.A. Law episode and Beyond Reality, like we mentioned already. Uh, you worked on an episode of Sequest, it looks like, um, and Odyssey 5, and you even worked on a few episodes of Outer Limits. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, oh, it's, it's very, Sliders, sorry. And, and uh, also, um, I was on Profiler. <laughs> which was kind of a end you know, profiler. Yes. Yes. Chasing after, after serial killers show. Um, I, you know, I did get this reputation for being a science fiction writer, even though oddly enough, uh, in terms of staff, I've two of the shows have been cop and lawyer shows. And only one was a, was an actual science fiction show, but I've done scripts for a number of others. Um, I mean, I always try to have fun. I mean, I got to write the ghost story for Sequest, <laughs> which I was sure they were like, what? Um, and, uh, and and Odyssey 5, I was so disappointed that show did not get picked up for another season. I probably would have been hired on staff if, if it had. And I, I just thought it was such a cool premise and I really enjoyed writing for that. Outer Limits um, was a lot of fun, except that the two hour Sand Kings, which was the adaptation of George's very famous award-winning short story again it was you know initially they were going to cast marley marley maitland who was a very famous deaf actress in the in the role of this wife and because i knew how to write for marley and it would have been so cool because i was going to have her be a sculptor and you know that uh, and then they decided they weren't gonna they got cold feet the studio about using her which was a shame because she's a wonderful actress um, and so that all had to change as well, but, uh, but that was a really fun one to write. So I, I did enjoy doing that. Um, although trying to say to George, yeah, you know, that whole thing about the short story and how he's this really strange, weird guy living alone in the desert. Yeah. We're not doing any of that, <laughs> you know, on another planet. No, mm -mm. it's uh -huh. like in San Diego, <laughs> you know, um, because it's television. It's a different medium. You've got to make it relatable. So while you were doing all that, were you paying attention to what happened in the world of uh, Star Trek? Were you watching any of that as a viewer? No. <laughs> I, uh, I've i never watched an episode of any of the subsequent seasons of Next Generation or any of the subsequent shows. Um, when I said I was burnt out, I meant I was really burnt out. Um, 
Um, I, I don't think Ricky will mind because he put it out on Twitter, but as he put out on Twitter, I don't know, a month or so ago, he said, uh, Star Trek really put the T and the S in PTSD. Um, and, <laughs> and that's how I felt. Um, so I never watched another uh, film, TV series, nothing. Um, I did watch uh, the JJ movies. <laughs> um, and, uh, do, do share. Well, <laughs> hopefully someday I'll get a job again. But um, I, yeah, I you know the first one had the right feel, and the cast was amazing. And I you know I forgave it because my understanding was that they had to shoot a very early draft of the script because again we had a writer strike. This one I got to march in because I was actually a member of the guild. Um, but um, I, I kept watching it and going, this doesn't make any sense. Why is the apex predator on the snow planet red, A, which is like a stupid minor thing. But then my other problem was I kept wanting to say to the pissed off Romulans, why don't you all just go home and tell everybody the star is going to blow up? <laughs> why, and everybody else. <laughs> yeah, why are you running around after old Spock? I mean, it was just baffling the second one i thought was just a mess bluntly you know you have again a terrific cast i mean you got benedict gumberbatch for god's sake but he's not peter, Khan. Weller, yeah. peter i mean it was yeah it should have been and, and i would have been much more interested if it had actually been about an, a disaffected starfleet officer who blew up headquarters you know who is that guy yeah. um and yeah, because case in point it had the daystrom institute yeah yes and so i i just um you know, that one, I, I, I kept laughing through most of it, especially when Khan revealed his cunning plan to hide his crew in, in missiles. And I kept thinking, I have a lot of friends in the military and, you know, inevitably some supply sergeant's gonna go, you know, we got all these old missiles over here. Why don't we use them for some target practice out in sector seven, you know? I mean, it just was like, that does not strike me as genius. So I, I that one was eh. The third one, I wasn't certain I was going to see, but when I saw that Simon Pegg had written the script and he is so wonderful, Hot Fuzz, Shaun of the Dead, you know, I thought I'm, I'm gonna go. And and indeed the, the script had a levity and a joy to it that I think has been missing so often in Trek. And I liked all of that, but I was disappointed in the end because to be true Star Trek, Kirk should have brought the his antagonist back to the light you know, back and, and, and to understanding and forgiveness. Um, and so that felt off to me that, that you know, he, that the man died. Um, I mean, the thing about Trek has always been that, that redemption is possible. And so I was, I was disappointed in that part of it, that aspect of it. But I, I did like the third film better than the previous two. And then I, you know, I really haven't watched Discovery. Um, I took a look at the, at the, pilot and it it didn't capture me um and so i kind of hadn't watched and there's so much else to watch and then we came to picard <laughs> yes yeah let's talk about picard because obviously uh your episode measure of a man informs the picard series in a very big way when did you learn about this after the first episode had aired uh, so no I, one reached out to you, no one informed you, no one wanted to consult with you, they just went with it. No. Because, uh, yeah, to be clear, even though it was probably work for hire, you did create the character of Maddox and, and so on, correct? Yes, yes. Um, in fact, I, I will, I am uh, owed a character creation payment by, by CBS, uh, according to the Writers Guild rules, for the use of my character, since he's now appeared on screen. No, no one reached out, no one contacted me, no one informed me, and uh, so it was a complete surprise. I mean, you know, flattering, certainly, uh, humbling that they would think so highly of that episode that they would, you know, set it as a foundation for building this this new series. You know, obviously I would have loved to have been involved, but uh, but such was not the case. It was, it was fans um, who started contacting me saying, hey, did you know this? And I was like, no. Uh, and then when people started asking for interviews, I thought, well, I guess I better start watching this thing. So I'm so what's gonna... been your feeling since then, now that we're about halfway through? Have you been able to watch all five episodes thus far? Yes, I have. And I've actually been invited by um, 
uh, by Make It So podcast that uh, I've done a couple of uh, analyses of episodes four and five with them, which has been fun to sort of look at it. I mean, I think the show looks fantastic, very well directed, great cast. Um, I think there are some structural issues with the scripts. I like the dialogue. I like the fact, again, that, that it's not taking itself quite so seriously. I mean, clearly there are serious issues, um, but... Uh, you know, uh, Agnes appealed to me because of her sort of smart mouth and pushiness, you know, even though we all knew what was going to inevitably happen with Agnes, that was pretty clear. But I, I liked the the sort of charm and, and Rios with his crazy alternative people that he has wandering around his ship. I still don't understand how they do things since they're holograms, but I'm not going to get into it. I'm just assuming it's like magic and it works. But uh, I'm liking that. I just, I, I just sometimes kind of want to go, why didn't you use that Romulan pirate in a more interesting way in episode four? I mean, you know, why, why didn't he, why did you have to pay the bribe to him to get to go down to the planet? And, you know, and then he gets annoyed and that's why he tries to blow you guys up. I mean, I, I couldn't ever understand things seem to happen without me truly grasping why, um, or having felt like it's been set up sufficiently. You're but, not alone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, overall, I, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, I mean, well, it's also being anchored by a very fine actor and Jonathan, who's a very fine director has been doing a very good job on the episodes he's directing. Um, I just like to see a little bit more cohesion uh, in these episodes in terms of the structure. How do you feel about the themes going on in the writing? Because what I really enjoyed with The Measure of a Man were the themes that were so baked into it, not just uh, legally, or the from the legal aspect, but the human themes, which were so very fundamentally Star Trek. This is something that many feel are missing in this series. Do you have any uh, yeah, thoughts on that? I think they are there. I just don't think they're they're quite as evident yet. Um, and perhaps they will be once the, once everybody gets in the same place. Um, Soji and, and our and our Scooby gang, you know, who are going after her. Um, I do think there are themes. I mean, I thought the theme for, for episode five was about what the, the aspects of love and that love can drive you to some very dark places and some very hurt places. Um, but it's, it, they are a little bit, a number of levels below the surface. So you kind of have to have to dig for them more than I would like. I mean, what I do like is the fact that we're seeing a version of the, of the universe that isn't quite so pristine. And I actually prefer that. Um, I just don't, I, I just think perfection is ultimately boring. It doesn't, you know, drama is all about conflict. Um, and, and at the moment they aren't dealing with huge themes of, what makes us human and, you know, how do we love? And I mean, perhaps they will get there because in some ways this, this child, if you will, of data is a surrogate child for Picard, the man who never had children. And, you know, that's where I'm wondering if they're going. Uh, I mean, the, the, the mother superior at the Romulan, you know, nunnery or whatever they are sort of made the point that he didn't like children. And so, you know, maybe that's a theme they're pursuing. I think the jury's out. I think we're gonna have to see where, where it goes. I think some people are uncomfortable with the fact that these people are less perfect than perhaps earlier incarnations of, of Trek characters have been. And I actually enjoy that because it gives you more to work with. But, you know, I do see where it can feel a little bit jarring. Um, I just think we have to see where they take it. I hope they take it to someplace deeply moving because ultimately, even the people on the board cube, they're trying to return people to humanity at the hands of a girl who isn't actually human. And so, you know, that, that's interesting, but what are they, you know, where is it going? And I still don't understand what the Romulan, I mean, the Romulans just seem to be sort of terminally pissed off about a lot of stuff. And I never know why. I mean, whether it's not going home to say, everybody move, 
or you know this i'm i'm still sort of baffled by it all yeah i personally i think that it's weird that the romulans are that angry at picard and the federation when they're an empire and should be perfectly capable of taking care of themselves right <laughs> so that's me instead uh, they just sit on a planet for 20 years yeah, um, and they do have an empire. I mean, were all of those planets within the blast radius of the of the you know? The you're asking the Nova? same questions all of us ask, <laughs> and that's that's the fundamental issue I think with the show is that you could enjoy it if you weren't stopping every five minutes or five seconds to go wait a minute. That doesn't make sense because you're asking yourself twenty questions. Yeah. Um, but speaking of Maddox, real quick. How did you feel about the portrayal of the character and his ultimate demise, I guess, <laughs> in, well, the, in one I, of my recent episodes? I mean, I, I understand why why he needed to die, because he knows too much, and otherwise he just tells Picard everything that he needs to know, and then, you know, where's the show? I mean, clearly, clearly that character had to be removed. But, and I loved the the scene where Agnes is looking at home movies of, of her and Bruce baking cookies. And the reason I loved it is I always kind of hated the replicator just as much as I hate the holodeck. Um, and I love the idea that he's a man who's like, this is community, this is love, this is affection, this is you and I together baking cookies. And then we're gonna sit down and eat them and drink some milk and you know, then maybe neck for a while because clearly they were a couple. Um, I liked that scene a great deal. I don't think we got to see much of him other than the fact he was drinking too much. And I kept yelling at the screen, don't drink that. They're going to poison you or <laughs> drug you or something. Um, he didn't seem as bright as I had pictured the man to be. Um, I had assumed that he's a very smart guy. And clearly he was because he built Dodge and Soji. You know, I mean, he succeeded. Uh, so, it, but we didn't see that in him. He was, you know, first scared and then he was beat up and then he was dead. So, you know, right. not a lot of, I mean, you know, I'm not certain. Um, I know that the actor, Brian Brophy, who played the role initially is now a professor and perhaps he, you know, doesn't act anymore. Uh, so I could see why they got a new actor. I just wish that we'd had a little more sense of who that man was 35 years ago. You've written so much other stuff. What stands out to you most? I, you know, I think there was a, a particular arc that I wrote for Reasonable Doubts about an Israeli Nazi hunter uh, operating in the United States and the issues of, you know, can someone ever expiate their sin? Um, and I was very proud of that that whole arc that I did and, and flattered because um, my boss picked one of my episodes to represent us um, for potentially being nominated for an Emmy. Um, and he picked my episode. And, and again, because I like to, I want to write about things that matter, um, really matter. And, and so that was, that was something I'm, I'm quite proud of. Um, you know, my work in wild cards with George, we created this shared world anthology together. We edit it together. I, I write for it. I think we've done some really interesting work there about issues of marginalized people and, you know, what it means to, to be the outsider. And, and in my own work, I, I think um, in particular two series, one is my edge series, which is about the war between science and rationality, and superstition, religion, and magic. I come down on the side of science and rationality because I think the world is is filled with too much stupid right now. And then my Imperial series, which is my big space opera, and I'm actually working on almost done with book five, which ends this this particular set of arc of stories, is again about a society in crisis and issues of class, issues of marginalized second class citizens. Um, how do you create a governing structure that functions? And also I, I got the idea because I had this image of this like 10 foot tall ant-like alien creature with big claws and giant mandibles cowering in terror in front of a human, a little tiny human holding a rifle, um, a machine gun. And I thought to myself, what if we were the evil invading aliens? And that was sort of the genesis of that whole book series. Um, but I, I like I like issues of economics and and society and politics. Um, action for the sake of action ultimately bores me, 
And so I think it was one of the problems with the space opera is nobody quite knew how to market it because yes, there are spaceships and there are aliens and there are some space battles, but it's a lot about, about uh, how societies function. Very true. Um, you said earlier, obviously, that Star Wars inspired you to become a writer. Um, how do you feel about the recent Star Wars films? Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. Um, I mean, uh, the first one was, a, you know, if I'm kind, I can say it's an homage to, you know, New Hope, the very first Star Wars movie, because structurally it's exactly the same movie. Um, I, you know, I'll probably get people yelling at me, but I really liked The Last Jedi. Um, I thought it was a fascinating deconstruction of myth and that people begin to get too comfortable believing in their myths and have to be shaken out of it. Um, I loved Luke's journey from despair and bitterness to a man who once again decides to, to care. Um, and so I, you know, I liked the film. Um, and then the third film, I was very disappointed. I was very disappointed. I, I thought that they should have built on, on The Last Jedi. Um, I mean, they were just, I, I spent the entire movie going, well, how did they build and why, and, huh? Um, yeah, and that's never a good thing when you're no longer in the moment and you're asking all these questions. Now, Star Wars on television, you know, Mandalorian, fantastic. I love it, uh, watched it twice now. I love Rebels. I love the Clone Wars. I immediately jumped on this, you know, next uh, first streaming episode of the, the final season of Clone Wars. Um, I think they're doing a very good job there. I just wish they could get a handle on 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 these big these big films. And the problem is they're too big. It's the same problem with the Marvel universe. It's like I don't need you to threaten. I don't need threat escalation. I think threat escalation ultimately just becomes eye-rollingly boring. Um, they're going to destroy New York. No, they're going to destroy the Earth. No, they're going to destroy the entire universe. Um, oh, please, <laughs> you know, tell me something that matters to people, um, and and in a in a small personal way. And I think we're losing sight of that in a lot of these spectacles. As a uh, as a side note, I would like your opinion on another movie as well. I noticed that you liked Princess of Mars. That's a novel that I'm quite fond of myself. Uh, what did you feel about the John Carter movie? Oh, yeah, I was you. one of the many writers writing, trying to write when it was still going to be a Princess of Mars as opposed to John Carter. And everybody goes, who the heck is John Carter? <laughs> what? Um, I, I was so disappointed. Um, and I... I, I just, I crawled over broken glass and begged Disney because I had been hired by Disney to, uh, to adapt uh, Battleship Yamato, our Star Blazers. Um, and unfortunately it didn't move forward and they loved my script, but things happened because it's Hollywood and it never got made. And then when I found out, then we did, we tried to do wild cards for them and that didn't work out. Um, and then this chance came up for Princess of Mars and I begged, I pleaded, I was like, please, I love this book and I understand this book. And they never got it. I mean, they never understood that it is a grand and sweeping love story. And that's where they needed to focus it. Um, they were so busy trying to give John Carter an arc that they ended up creating a character I couldn't stand and uh, just messing together with all this action that again, I didn't need, you know, the heart of that was, was Dejah Thoris and John Carter and a love that can transcend literally, you know, about millions of miles <laughs> in time and space. Um, and they didn't get it. So I was, the Green Martians looked great, however, <laughs> they were good. Um, but, uh, but the rest of it was really disappointing, <laughs> so. Speaking of fans, though, um, how do you feel about uh, people who work in the industry who lash out at fans and their opinions about the the movies that are coming out? Because I mean, even though you liked the Last Jedi, there was a you know a large group of fans who weren't happy about it, and famously, the director had no qualms about attacking Star Wars fans online. And this extends into the Star Trek fandom and 
other ones we've seen more recently. I, I don't know how, from somebody on the inside of the industry, how do you view that, you know, that point of view? I mean, look, I understand it's, you know, you've, you've labored, you've spent months, if not years, bringing something to life. You've poured your heart into it. I get that. But, uh, you know, not everybody's going to love everything you do. And I think, you know, being gracious and being kind and, and, you know, to some degree, those of us who've been lucky enough to get to go on movie sets and television and write TV shows and have fabulous actors say your dialogue. I mean, I respect Ryan Johnson. I think he's a very good director. I just think it's wiser to, you know, never punch down and don't react, don't respond, you know, take a long walk, let it go. Um, and, and unfortunately it's, it's the times in which we live. I mean, you know, we, we unfortunately have a troll who's president and Twitter and the internet in general has become a place in which people's worst instincts can come out. Um, and I think it's a shame because the idea that I can sit at my computer and have a conversation with someone on the other side of the world should be wonderful and empowering and exciting. And instead of it's become very toxic. Um, but I don't think, I don't think you should ever respond. Um, I just, you know, take it, let people, and, and some of these people are going to push harder to try to get you to respond, but I think you have to, you just have to step back and, and remember, I, I always go back to Thumper's mother's advice in Bambi, which is if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> you know, that's sort of become my mantra for how I live online. That and don't just eat the flowers, eat the greens too. <laughs> I and, like it, uh, yes. That's, <laughs> yes, that is healthy life advice for us all. And with that, I would like to thank you, Melinda, for joining us and sharing your experiences. Which projects of yours is it that everyone that liked The Measure of a Man and wants to find out more should check out? We are in the process of re-releasing all three of my book series. Um, and so please come and follow me on Twitter. I'm mmsnodgrass23. Uh, I'm very active on Facebook and I have a webpage, melindasnodgrass.com. Uh, and as books become available, uh, hopefully within the next few weeks to a month, we'll be dropping uh, books of all these various series and we'll be announcing that. So, you know, if you like them, uh, you know, take a look and uh, come and hang out. I like to visit with people. And I'm also working on uh, hopefully filming a TV pilot that I wrote uh, sometime this summer. So, you know, trying to get that all set up as well. So life goes on and I keep creating. All right. Thank you. We're so excited to, to see what you will be doing next. It was a great honor to get to talk to you. Thank you so much. This was a real pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.